He was transformed genetically after his mother was bitten by a vampire, who I'm still looking for to this day. Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. We live in the Marvel age of blockbuster movies. The MCU is the highest grossing franchise of all time. Endgame is the highest grossing film of all time. There's a statue of Captain America in Brooklyn and my mom knows who Thanos is. That is Marvel domination. And the film that started it all wasn't Iron Man or Spider-Man or even X-Men. It was Blade. The C-tier 1970s comic book character meant to capitalize on the trends of black exploitation films and monster movies. So how did this day-walking wannabe Avenger become the most influential film of the past 20 years? Well, it all starts with Wesley Snipes. He didn't just play Blade, he became Blade. He refused to break character during production of the three films. Patton Oswalt co-starred in Blade Trinity, and he said that Snipes only communicated with the director through post-it notes signed Blade. And Wesley Snipes did at least one interview in complete character. Can't wait to meet up with daddy again. How method is Wesley Snipes? One day you wake up, brush your teeth, and someone yells cut because you've been Wesley Snipes for your entire life. That's how method Wesley Snipes is. Anyways, this interview is amazing. A grown man, an action star, talking with utter sincerity about Chris Christopherson raising him to be a vampire hunter. It's really, really silly. Still, this clip shows just how ahead of their time Snipes in the first Blade film were. In 1998, practically no one in Hollywood took comic books seriously at all, much less this seriously. <laughs> See, back then, comic book movies weren't serious, even when they starred serious actors. Comic books were about as far out of the zeitgeist as you can get. They didn't speak to contemporary ideas, at least as far as the movies were concerned. Now, from the perspective of 2020, it's clear that Blade is one of the most important and influential movies of the last quarter century. But before we talk about Blade, let's consider the cinematic landscape it was released in. In 1998, comic book movies were at their lowest ebb in years. I am the law! Two DC movies came out the year before. Steel. Well, you know I've got to push the envelope. Yeah, I know you do. And Batman and Robin. There's something about an anatomically correct rubber suit. Both were critical and commercial flops, and Warner Brothers wouldn't make another DC Comics movie for seven years. For all intents and purposes, the DC movie universe was dead. And that was still significantly better than Marvel's box office track record at that time. While the company had been one of the two biggest names in comics for more than 30 years, just one of their properties had ever been adapted into a theatrically released feature film, Howard the Duck, which was not only terrible, it sexually confused a generation. Beth. Let's be realistic. I mean, my apartment's zillions of miles from here. <gasps> You're three feet taller than I am. <gasps> and there was also the direct-to-video Captain America movie and The Punisher, where he never actually wore the famous skull symbol. Marvel was a joke. And the Marvel movie made before Blade was Roger Corman's Fantastic Four, a production so atrocious, the film has never been officially released to this day. But it's on YouTube, you should watch it. It's horrible and awful, I love it. Rock. Now, in 2020, the Marvel Studios logo is practically a license to print money. But in the 90s, the name Marvel was box office poison. Now, Tim Burton's Batman movie from 1989 took itself seriously, and it was a huge blockbuster. But almost every other non-Batman 90s comic book adaptation was a failure. And Warner Brothers even squandered the serious tone of those Burton Batman films with Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Seven million. <laughs> Never leave the cave without it. Not Blade. This was a comic book movie set in a present day world of bloodthirsty vampires, hip hop, and techno music. The very first action sequence showers an underground rave with blood. Blade had an R rating, which was unheard of in its day and almost just as rare now. And it's filled with extensive blood and gore. The hero even drops F-bombs all through the movie. What the f are you out of your damn mind? This was a far cry from Christopher Reeve's Superman. Another way that Blade was a pioneer is he didn't have a secret identity. He strolls into a hospital, he shoots at vampires, and tells cops off with no attempt to hide his face. This was another major break with superhero movies up to that point, 
which were entirely consumed with Supermans and Batmans and assorted other costume do-gooders who expended a lot of screen time trying to hide their secret identities. Although this may not seem like a huge change, think about it. Most Marvel movies followed Blade's lead. When X-Men came out two years later, the team did not wear masks, and they traded their comic-accurate costumes for outfits that mimic Blade's. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Ten years later, Iron Man ended with Tony Stark effectively ending secret identities in the MCU. I am. Oh, sorry, wrong one. This one. I am Iron Man. So let's talk about the costumes. In 1999, The Matrix made leather and black overcoats the de facto costume for an entire generation of action heroes. But Blade was released six months before that. His armor broke from the tradition established by the Burton movies, where superheroes were encased in mountains of stiff latex. You know, like when Batman walked around in a giant rubber condom and he couldn't move his head. Wesley Snipes' Blade costume is elaborate, but it doesn't restrict his movement allowing director Stephen Norrington to deliver complex action sequences that highlighted his star's martial arts skills. Look at the difference in action between Burton's Batman and Norrington's Blade. During Batman's big action finale, Michael Keaton mostly stands in place while bad guys jump and kick around him. In the most extreme example, one of the Joker's goons performs a pretty solid gymnastics routine, Screen Crush scores at a 10, and then the guy leaps at Batman with a kick. Keaton watches all of this transpire without moving a muscle and then drops the guy with one punch and some kind of bat gadget he extends from his hand. Fight over. Now, compare that to the finale of Blade, where Snipes takes on a whole army of vampires working for the evil Deacon Frost. <laughs> Keaton's bat costume gave him the illusion of an outlandish comic book physique in exchange for any mobility at all. Snipes, in contrast, needed no help in the muscle department. He's absolutely jacked. Now, he came out of the era of Schwarzenegger, Stallone, and Van Damme. You know, when movie stars were f***ing terrifying. After Batman, ripped movie stars were far less common in comic book movies until Blade. Another way that Blade was influential is that fight sequence starts with Snipes nailing a three-point landing. Yeah, now they're a cliche, but as far as I can tell, Wesley Snipes pioneered this move. Well, him or Justin Timberlake. In general, Snipes' movement as Blade was way ahead of his time. Without a bulky rubber costume, he was able to strike with equal amounts of grace and violence, like a cross between Bruce Lee and Mikhail Baryshnikov. Now, superheroes of that era could sometimes look impressive just when they were at rest, but they rarely seemed impressive in motion. Snipes' blade looked faster and more agile than everyone else on screen. He really sold the idea that this guy is a superhuman. That in-character interview from 1998 is goofy, but it clearly shows that all of these elements were deliberate on Snipes and Norrington's part. Playing a comic book character is the best of all worlds, because anything goes. Create a different voice, create a different look, different sound, different way of moving with you're talking. All the stuff very different from Wesley. Snipes concludes the interview with a prediction. I think we're creating a shadow world where the bridge between what is reality and the unreal is very small. Not only did Blade do exactly that, but that shadow world became the template for nearly every Marvel movie that followed. Wesley Snipes had a goofy way of showing it, but he saw the future. In Blade, he helped build a bridge to a new way of bringing comic books out of the shadows. Guys, let me know what you think of Blade in the comments below. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.